Live from Las Vegas, it's theCUBE. Covering Discover 2016 Las Vegas. Brought to you by Hewlett Packard Enterprise. Now, here are your hosts, John Furrier and Dave Vellante. Okay, welcome back everyone. We are here live in Las Vegas. This is Hewlett, the Hewlett Packard Enterprise Discover 2016. This is Silicon Angles, the Cube, our flagship program. Where we go out to the events and extract the signal from noise. I'm John Furrier, my co-host Dave Vellante, and our next guests, Milan Shetty, CTO of HP Enterprise Storage, and Eric Holbert, CEO of Opus Interactive, cloud service provider. Uh, welcome back to the Cube, great to see you. Yeah, welcome back to the here. first time. Yeah, thanks for having us. Cube alumni now. Um, <laughs> no, he's been on. You've been on before? Yep. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Worlds. Cube alumni, <laughs> all right. 2014. You got there it. There you go, great memories so, out of you. Yeah. Running a cloud service provider requires a lot of storage action. It does. Multi-tenancy, a lot of complexity. Um, tell us about how you're using HP storage. Yeah, so you know, we picked HP storage before HP even acquired this particular type of technology, the software-defined storage, right? So Left Hand Networks was the original company that we went with back in like 04, 05. We've been using Hewlett Packard Enterprise equipment since the early 2000s. And we really wanted a storage platform that was scalable and we didn't want to be controller bound. So we made that selection early on, one of the very first customers. So and when you say you didn't want to be controller bound, you mean big expensive disk controller bound? Yeah, the big monolithic SANs with you know, yeah, they got redundant controllers, but we're still controller bound. Eventually, after you add enough shelves, you're going to need to then do a lift and shift, move all your data. That's obviously time consuming. It's risky to our clients since we obviously have to cater to a lot of different verticals. We wanted something that every time we added a shelf, we would add performance. And that's where what now is obviously store virtual VSA. You know, we're nearing a petabyte of that particular platform, almost all store virtual for us at this point. Uh, on our platform. What was the biggest problem that you had to solve that, that the software-defined storage paradigm fit the bill for you guys? And then how did that shape going forward in today's market? And what um, did that solve for you guys? Well, you know, it solved a, a couple different key things. Obviously, right, cost was one aspect. You want enterprise class services with all that multi-tenancy redundancy for customers. So having each of those pieces sort of, you know, woven into the story behind it was sort of key for us. Um, and then obviously just with the enterprise support from the services side of Hewlett Packard and the partnership we've had, that maturity over a long period of time since we've been with them for so long, just made a perfect marriage for us. So you know, Milan, usually when you come on theCUBE, we talk about three par. We're not, <laughs> let's save that maybe for storage day tomorrow or the party tonight. But this whole notion of software defined is one of the vectors that you're, you're going down. That's right. Maybe talk about that a little bit and how it's evolved into this notion of a storage fabric. Yeah, so, um, so in HPE, uh, HPE has not been a uh, pure storage player, right? We have an external storage business. We have also lots of servers with the internal storage we ship. And in fact, uh, with the latest analyst uh, IDC report, HPE is the number one storage provider, uh, period. I when heard that to today in the storage. keynotes, yeah. number one now. Yeah, number one, and uh, both internal and external storage combined uh, kind of number, uh, and uh, very, very first time in a very long time, EMC is not the number one. So we always saw two different design centers. There is a design center which is an external storage, three part led, as you, as you lamented, that, that's something which I've talked about at every CUBE session I've had with you. <laughs> uh, and this time, thanks to customers like Eric, um, I have an opportunity to talk about the software defined storage and the common data fabric, as we're calling it. Um, the data fabric uh, to us, the second design center, is about the software defined storage and also uh, anything which has got servers with internal storage, whether it's a rack mount, or a bladed form factor. In Eric's case, uh, Eric has uh, the bladed form factor, uh, which he's predominantly uh, been using. So, um, the, um, you know, if we, uh, in the common data fabric, uh, there were three major attributes which we have been looking at from a common data fabric standpoint. You need a stack which can deliver storage uh, services and I call them the three Ms. Maturity, manageability at scale, and mobility. Those are the three main characteristics required for the common data fabric. Um, and um, you know, the uh, interesting part about the about 2006, 2007 timeframe, uh, due to its adoption by service providers such as Opus Interactive, um, we had acquired left hand networks and that was the foundation of our common data fabric. Um, we have over two million licenses out there today of the common data fabric, so uh, already, uh, right? And the maturity aspect which Eric mentioned, Eric's been in production with this since 2005, a decade yeah. of maturity. And 
from the storage industry, you know, maturity, it takes a long time for the data stack to mature. So the first time covered, manageability, the dimension about the uh, one view and expanding that around the one view and the manageability of the scale, and mobility. We know from our three-part experience as well how federation, moving between the old and the new, expandability and everything are the key characteristics, and that's how uh, that's the core principle of our common data fabric. So Eric, you're, you're essentially running your business on this scale-out fabric, is that right? That's and, correct, and, yep. and so production workloads across multiple verticals. So when, when did you start the company? Uh, we started the company in 1994, and uh, we split it off from this parent company in 2008, uh, we've grown to uh, five locations now. And so obviously like uh, Milan was talking about manageability with one view is very important because we've got multiple locations to obviously manage all the different storage platforms. But we have at this point just shy of a thousand customers. You know, and managing that many customers and their different workloads and requirements obviously is very important because we're dealing with that multi-tenancy aspect. And the vast majority are running on this fabric, is that right? Or are they all correct. running on this yeah, fabric? Yeah, they're all running on, on this fabric. Because most service providers that, are that have been around that long, if you poke around, under the covers, there's one of these, and one of those, and three of those, and just sort of depending on you know, storage platform du jour. So you basically swept the floor of everything but this fabric. Yep, we're 100% Hewlett Packard Enterprise for all of our hardware and storage. Well, obviously we also do co-locations. We've got co-location customers that have their own stuff in their cabinets, but that wouldn't be equipment that we purchased or managed. And everything is provisioned through an API, yep. all software defined. Yep. Talk, can you talk about that a little bit more in terms of how you got there and, and what that business impact has been? Uh, yeah, I mean, it's been a long journey, right? I mean, actually, Milan was asking me how many engineers we have, and we're up to 11 engineers right now, right? So our ratio of the amount of servers we're managing engineers is quite high because of that automation and all of the software platforms that we have. In order to do that kind of scale, you're going to have to have, right, a right. very good software-defined architecture and infrastructure to be able to manage that much service. We had 30 minutes to go into overtime on this segment because we've got a little bit of cloud too here. So I got to ask you, that kind of engineering, you have that 10X kind of developer mindset. Correct. You got real good leverage. It's not like you have 400 engineers banging away at code the old waterfall way. Yep. You guys are classic DevOps. Right? Yeah, I mean, right. Right, really it's virtualization behind the scenes of cloud, right? I mean, we were doing cloud. Yeah. We launched our official cloud product in 2000, late 2005. Yeah. Four is really you know, being called cloud. We do a lot of hybrid yeah, yeah. between the colo and our cloud offering in addition to the public cloud bursting, right? So do you, got, I shouldn't say it this way, but I'll try to phrase it in a good, elegant way. A lot of people come in, I want to be a cloud developer, or I want to be DevOps, I'm a DevOps guy. You can't really be a DevOps, but you got to kind of earn it. And yeah. the early DevOps days, or early cloud days, pure DevOps really was forging new ground. You guys are part of that wave. Mm -hmm. What have you learned over, the, over those years and how would you give people advice today that kind of want to go to school to be a DevOps engineer? Um, really, I would say, you know, from transitioning to also managing developers, it's being flexible, right, in the platforms that are out there. Things are changing, um, you know, and even like moving in from virtualization now, we got containers and you got Docker, which is another announcement that was happening today, right? Having yeah. Docker being bundled on all HP servers. And that's huge for us too, because we're getting ready to launch a container as a service offering. But really, from a DevOps standpoint, right, I think it's going to be coming down to that flexibility and being open to the different platforms as the change happens. And containers as a service is one of those things where there's a lot of dogma around there right now relative to your view of it. Is there a one size fits all container? What microservices are out there? What's your take on all that uh, containers as a service? Is um, it best uh, to be open 100% or? No, I think there's going to be, need to be a combination of this. So the platform we're looking to launch is going to be you know, platform agnostic. We'll be able to do both Windows as well as Starnix type servers. And we want to be not everything to everybody, but to, to provide that one missing piece for us, which is to really cover the developers and the people that are looking for microservices at scale, right? So here's some conversations we had earlier on, on our crowd chat I want to bring up because the cloud guys couldn't answer it. Uh, Keith Townsend said, I don't believe hardware is material. What value is containers of service specifically over infrastructure service? I believe customers will roll their own container platforms and look towards providers for pass. Containers are just a footnote in the conversation. Pass will run on top of container plumbing. <laughs> Thoughts on the... On well, those two you know, comments. I think with Keith any Townsend shift, Keith Townsend is a great, great uh, CTO out there. Yeah, I mean, with any shift in technology, right, you're going to have to worry about those changes over time. But you know, like we just heard in the keynote earlier, it's going to be about 50% of the workloads are going to shift to containers because it is like more nimble, and you can move that across a lot of different geographies. And yeah, the ones that try to pull it in house, like most things, are going to eventually learn, right? Like, like even the power. Like if you look way back in the beginning, not everyone wants to run their own power plant. Not everyone's yeah. going to be able to run all their own little individual servers. They want to focus on their application. The developers don't really care about the infrastructure yeah, I mean, or anything behind the scenes. They just 
want yeah. it to work and they want to be able to launch that fast. Call it a wrap or whatever you want to call it. Developers love this concept. Milan, try me on right. this. Uh, absolutely. And, and I think one of the things which uh, Eric and I were talking about this is that the, the, uh, as a service provider, Opus Interactive and Eric and the team saw the value of virtualization and how virtualization can be delivered to the uh, thousand customers which, which they have. And they, they chose on a common data fabric to make sure that at least that, that piece of the infrastructure is uh, stable, mature, manageable at scale, and provides the data mobility. And as they look into the container uh, set of technologies, that there's, it's not going to be virtualization taken over containers, and there's going to be a buy, there's going to be both these technologies are going to be around for a while. There will be overlapping applications. There are different use cases and everything. And the fact that Eric can Eric and his team can make a choice of keeping the data fabric common across both their virtualized environment and also the containers in future is a real value proposition for them. And that's the, yeah. that's the power we see with the common data fabric. So at least on the data side and the data management side and the data layout side and the storage side, they don't have to worry about that. The container stuff, total home run, down to the storage. How much of that is automated? And how much is, uh, because it's all about focus, we get some human involvement, but yeah. you know, this kind of 10X developer can be applied to infrastructure if you look at it that way. So the goal is to free up the labor resource. Absolutely, absolutely. I think the, the provisioning aspect, in addition to the application provisioning, the storage provisioning aspect is also pretty heavy, uh, if, if not done right. Right, APIization, restization, and everything, and trying to make sure that all the storage nodes in the software-defined world, servers with internal storage, they may have different generation of servers in them. They may have different uh, characteristics. They may have SSDs, some may have hard disk drives, some may have old under generation hard disk drive and everything. And how do you automate and provisioning thousands and thousands of users, uh, and thousands and thousands of storage nodes very easily, right? And that's the work we are doing from an infrastructure provider to Eric's standpoint to make sure that in one click of a button, they can go. You do the heavy put, lifting. HP heavy Enterprise lifting. does the heavy HP lifting. And, uh, HPE does the heavy lifting so that stack above is what Eric's team can focus on, which is their value add. And, and that's the bottom line. I mean, we've been talking for a while now on theCUBE that there's a shift going on in the market from, we, we, we said about $200 billion, from non-differentiated infrastructure lifting into vendor R&D. Right. Essentially, and that's yeah. really why you went in this direction, right? You can Correct. scale, automation. Yep. You know, we, we call it server sand. We, we've pegged by 2020, yeah. you know, the Wikibon forecast show, more than half of the spend is going to be on what we call server sand, what you guys are doing, fabric, software defined, you yep. know, pick whatever name you want, like not the big external controller. Uh, right. I love that phrase, server sand, because uh, <laughs> customers who are in the traditional shops, too. right? The traditional shops, they always yeah. have been trained and beaten up by the that the uh, other three-letter company, <laughs> which will soon be joined by a four-letter company, uh, <laughs> that sand, 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 sand. And when we talk to those customers who are traditional customers, who have not gone to virtualizations and who have not gone to container, and we say, this is server sand, they get it. Three plus four is seven. Three plus four is seven, I like that. <laughs> of course, that could change the number one again. <laughs> so that was, that was, uh, that's right. It's a horse race. <laughs> that brings up a good point. Service hand is a great word because it redefines really what the, what the operating model is. But again, the constant theme for all of our conversations here in theCUBE, you nailed it, is the operating model of the customers changing and also the delivery of the value is changing. The, the 10X developer I talked about, right. I think Mark Andreessen quoted that term around kind of the, the, the new age developer. You don't need 100, you can do 10. Right. Same with infrastructure. That's right. If you guys can enable that, that's, a, that's game changer. That, that's right, and, and you know, the, one of the advantages we have uh, from an HPE infrastructure provider standpoint, the Synergy platform, composable uh, infrastructure, bladed, rack mount and everything, doesn't matter, but it is actually the same software, data storage, stack across all the different form factor. And that provides, I mean, in from, even from an R&D standpoint, yeah. right? We do automation one across multiple platforms. So Eric can choose, he wants rack mount, or Eric can choose if he wants blade, or combination, and he's good to, good to go. Final yeah. question, since we got a break here, I want to get your thoughts, because we were talking earlier, siloed uh, stove pipes, as Dave calls them, I call them silos, were about best of breed. Certainly, when you talk about being a box mover back in the old days, now to a more solution um, oriented, how does best of breed change when ultimately you had a horizontally integrated architecture, whether that's industry standard hardware and or specialized boxes like service and whatnot, how does the definition of best of breed change? Because they about converged and composable. That's not best of breed because there's now a lot of different components. Some might be best of breed for a workload. What does best of breed mean? Does it mean anything? What is the new term then? It doesn't mean anything, thoughts. The new term is server sand. 
<laughs> yeah. No, so, so um, ironically, what's happening, right, is that the, there is a lot of changes which are happening in the blade and the rack mount servers as well. The non-volatile memory come in, the, uh, the 3D X point and everything. There is a lot of fundamental shifts which are happening in the hardware itself. And you, the best of breed now is going to be uh, first led with automation. Whatever has to be, has to be done at scale. Uh, automation is going to be a key characteristics and a key attribute. Second is going to be that whenever the uh, non-volatile memory and, and, and the prices of these are going to come down, non-volatile memory technology is coming in the servers and everything, is that what is the software stack? What is the mature software stack which you can deploy on is going to be very, very critical. I think maturity is going to be a big, big, big dimension of the uh, automation and maturity are going to be key characteristics of server and, and what was Integration too is a big table stake item, right? I mean, you talk about dealing with customers, making sure you got, multi, for again, multi-tenancy, very yeah. complex. Uh, Absolutely. Exactly, and I think, I think the, there is a, um, the, be, uh, the definition of best of breed now has, uh, is probably going to morph very quickly to customers such as um, Eric and Eric's customers want to adopt and be flexible and move very fast. Uh, and how do they do that? Um, at times... Uh, I think best of breed is changing to winning, just being right. fast to the finish line. That's uh, right. The outcome you want well, versus speeds and feeds. Exactly right, exactly right. I'm trying it's, to find and put a, my finger on the phrase. word. Well, I mean, best of breed made sense when you're talking about like this box is really good, it's got X MIPS or whatever, speeds and feeds, that those days are over, but now every outcome is different based on the workload. You can't really say this based on this spec, that's better, it kind of depends. Right. That's right, that's right. And you know, the, the funny thing is, right, I think the, um, if in two years, we're still talking about block, file, and object. <laughs> we failed. We failed, <laughs> miserably, yeah. right? As a, it as should be industry, invisible. It should be invisible. And maybe, yeah. maybe the new phrase is the infrastructure is generally invisible, yeah. and that it just provides agility for applications and the service providers to deploy. Maybe what you're going to change your business model to a revenue share. Free storage, that's <laughs> a revenue <laughs> share. Share the outcome. <laughs> <laughs> Guys, thanks so The customers would never do that. <laughs> Innovation on the cube, just, we're just kind of putting, connecting the dots every day, real time. Milan, Eric, thanks so much for sharing the insights. Boy. Congratulations on your business. Great to hear about the success and uh, being through the early days, pioneering the DevOps and being successful. Congratulations. Uh, this is the cube, connecting the dots here in real time. Best of breed, server sand, all here in the cube. We'll be right back with more live coverage from Las Vegas. After this break, you're watching theCUBE.